Hello everybody and welcome back to LMM and if you're enjoying what you're seeing on the channel at the moment then the links to our social media are coming up on the screen now including things like our Patreon if you want to help the channel grow and succeed and to the Discord if you want to be part of our community and discuss things that we show on the channel like trains, cars, planes, tractors and of course fire engines. Which brings me on to the subject of today's video. Lots of you have repeatedly asked for a walk around and a closer look at my Dennis RS fire engine. So today we're going to have a closer look at dupes. Isn't she beautiful? Now, I have bought many things since, well, before I started the channel and since the channel started, and this one I think remains my favorite because this is what started everything off. Jupiter is, well, it is the channel really, isn't it? Without Jupiter, I don't know if there would be LMM, at least not in the form that it is today. Now, most of you by now have realized what it is, and that is, it is a Dennis, yes, it is. Now, she is a Dennis RS-130, and to my knowledge, there are only four of these machines left. One of them is in Cuba. The other one is this one's sister, which is UCL-494W, um, which a friend of mine bought, in fact, the guy who sold me this, he then bought 494 to do that one up, and we have a photo somewhere of them sat side by side. Not a very good photo, but I'll bring it on the screen now. And then there's um, one up north. So yeah, three in this country one in Cuba, maybe. Now, the Dennis RS-133 is the same as this, only that one has an automatic gearbox. This one is fitted with the Turner T5.400 five-speed manual gearbox. And for me personally, having a manual gearbox really makes the truck. I'm not a fan of automatics, and having the manual in this just makes it great. Since recently we did a gearbox oil change on this, this has made the gearbox a lot easier to use. But when I say a lot easier to use, what I actually mean is it's slightly better. It isn't a gearbox that you can just use. You do rather need to know where the gates are and then have a small conversation with the machine and say, you are going to gear in gear. Gear is there and you are indeed going to go into it. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. That's just the nature of what she is. Now, it is fitted with the Perkins 540, which is an 8.8 .8 litre V8 which by most accounts is a half decent engine. And frankly, I really like it. It's a lovely sounding lump. The same engine was used in the, the RS-133, just the only difference between them was the gearbox. So there are quite a few of the 133s kicking around. The things that followed it as well, if you'll notice with Jupiter, it doesn't have any side windows in the center pillars there, which I guess are your B pillars, if kind of. On later versions, they then had windows in there, which I can tell you driving the thing around solo, it's a massive great blind spot. Basically, the little bit of history, because I don't think we've ever actually said her whole history on the channel. Now, she was ordered in 1979, it took two years for this order to be fulfilled by Dennis, but she was delivered in 1981 to Great Yarmouth, which is in Norfolk, the Norfolk Fire Service, and she was a primary machine there for several years before moving to Stalham. She was primary at Great Yarmouth, so primary is when they're new, and then they move to a secondary fire station. So that's like your smaller town or village fire station, where it was still in service, still working, but it's not a brand new appliance. And then they disposed of it in the August of 1995. I was five at this time when she went out of service. Now, most machines at this point are disposed of. Some are sold off, but most are disposed. So her story really should have ended in 95. But no, she was sold and went off to Haverhill and she worked at Industrial Flavours and Fragrances, which is a big chemical plant that I've, I've been to a couple of times, I've delivered in there. And they used her as their plant appliance. To the best of my knowledge, it never did anything there. And eventually they decided that they needed to expand, they needed the space, and so they could use a smaller fire engine, like, a, like the Land Rover ones you see, or a van-derived one. And this was, well, surplus to requirements. So it was sold in 2006. Now, it was during this period that it picked up its interesting checker plate doors. They are not standard. I know a lot of fire engine preservationists, or fire appliance preservationists, aren't a fan of my checker plate doors. And I'm, I'm mixed about them. They are striking, they are different, and I kind of like them because they're part of the machine's history. So something that's known for Dennis machines are they suffer from something called Dennis rot and that is the doors rot. The bottom of the doors rot out and the doors fall apart. If you find a Dennis cab in the scrapyard, probably got rotten doors. The repair that's been done here is actually quite good. They have cut out all the metal. I've had the sides off and they've cut out all the rotted metal and riveted those plates on. 
Now, I could at some point replace these doors with something different or find better doors or remake them. I don't really want to because it's part of its history. This is its guise when it was an industrial fire engine. Anyway, in 2006, it was sold and it was bought by the late Mel Skeet. Now, this chap is well known in the fire appliance preservation circles as he had several of the machines. And he used it uh, as part of his Suffolk Fire something or other training, but it also worked for Gardner Associates Fire Investigation training. And under this, it was funnily enough used as a training vehicle. And I believe it was during these days that it got run down to the state it was when I bought it. Because when I bought the thing, I was an idiot. And though I wouldn't change my mind now, there were many things wrong with it. Like the compressor didn't work very well, the alternator was on its way out, the starter was on its way out, it had various leaks in the fuel line, it had various leaks in the air line. It wasn't in the best condition. In fact, it was told to me later that they used to park it next door to our wall because the brakes would leak off and it would start rolling. She's a lot better now, I just want to stress that. In fact, most of it now we think we're on top of and she's okay. You may know from looking through the history of the channel, if you're a long-term viewer, that it hasn't exactly had a stellar service history with me, spending the majority of the channel's life being broken for one reason or another. And it was only finally in 2020, of about five years of ownership, that the machine started to actually come into its own right as a working machine. There are still things that are wrong with it. It's a vintage vehicle and there's still jobs I need to complete, but we are slowly getting there. And certainly, it's been quite the experience owning it. She is quite an imposing lump. And that's one of the things I really like about her, the fact that she was designed with basically a ruler and nothing else. It is a big red box, but it's a big red box which still very much associated with a fire engine. People look at it and immediately go, yeah, that's definitely a fire engine. Yet when you look a bit closer, she's wonderfully vintage, especially when you do compare her with a newer and modern vehicle. But it is kind of wonderful, isn't it? I mean, considering she's now 40 years old, she's doing pretty well. Now, it is quite the lump. And she weighs, well, she's gross plated. That means the maximum weight that she can transport is just under 12 tons, 11.7. I don't think I've ever had that much on it, anywhere near. The water tank back there in the middle of the lockers, well, that holds about 3,000 litres, which is about three tons. Then all the equipment, well, let's assume that's going to be around a ton, around, but when you've got all of that on it. So without any of that on, and the fact that she's pretty Spartan back there, at the moment, I think she's about seven and a half. I think, I think it weighs about the same as my Ruston. So moving across into here, we have our front bonnet here and tucked in here, which requires a little tap, there is the support. Now this is all fiberglass and flexes horribly. And the most immediate thing in here is the sheer massive radiator. One thing with Jupiter is it doesn't really get hot. She gets warm after you've been driving her for a bit, but just sitting around and idling, it won't ever register anything on the rad. And initially I thought this was some kind of you know, cause for concern, but it's not. It's just that radiator is massive. And of course it's meant to keep this machine cool and stop the engine from overheating when it's at a shout, you know, dealing with an emergency, like a massive fire, and the engine is running at full revs continuously. This radiator here has to keep it cool. So no wonder when it's just sat there idling, because I mean, it drops down, it drops down to basically the bottom of the bumper. It's massive. And it does also highlight one of the other major problems with this is the fact that the engine is behind that and this cab does not tilt. There are various suggestions of how you get your engine out. Some people say you take this off, take the radiator out, and the whole thing pulls out forwards. Others say you lift it up and take the roof off and lift it out through the roof. I've decided that I don't want to find out. I'm quite content with it staying in there. The other things on the bulkhead we have here are the heater and the air blower, well, air blower that's sat here. We have a couple other things put in. There's some extra wirings, bits, gubbins. We have the sensors which come off here and here, which are for the brakes. So that's your brake pedal. And these are little sensors in here, which when you push the brake, they push a little contact down and the brake lights come on all under the air power. And basically that's all we care about in here. And then I have my favorite thing, which is this impossibly long dipstick, which just amuses me intently because it has to obviously go all the way back to the engine. 
stick that in there. That's basically all there is here. Now I've got a washer bottle just hidden in there. Now that's really all there is to the front of it. It's glorious. So walking around here, we have a cab, funnily enough, two doors up front, and then seats for four at the back. When I got her, she didn't have seat belts, but we fitted those. Then stuck down there, we have the adapter for air tool, so we can run off the compressor, and then we have our lockers along here. The big problem with lockers on this fire engine is most of them don't lock. This one, at some point, has been added to have this latch, so you can put a padlock over it, and then lock it. Now, currently, I have very little in this. I have a helmet, I've got the board of information with many photos for when it goes there and some of the plaques that I've been into, so you know, rally plaques. And then I've got a mobile stretcher hidden in behind that. The next one in here, this has got a bit more in it. I do actually have a complete roll of hoses. Now they are not standard at all. They're all of different things. I have canvas, I have rubber, and then I've got my hydrant key somewhere. Where's the hydrant key? Oh, the hydrant key's the other side. I've got the standpipe. Oh no, hydrant key's in there. Hydrant key and the standpipe. So I could theoretically take water from a hydrant, you know, screw it in. Obviously I can't because that's not allowed, but I could theoretically. And then in the back here, I've got various other things which are interesting. So I've got a splitter for the rear for the pump, another nozzle that just floats around in here, another nozzle for me. Then I've got one of the side reel hoses, so these come out and pull out like so. And you've got these guns which shoot with a trigger on though. And these do work, I have had this all functioning before. Take the handle out, stick the handle onto the mechanism and then I can, if it engages, there we go, wind the stuff back in. And then the gun is meant to live somewhere down there, but it rarely does. I normally just leave the thing floating, to be honest, like so. Now, I do have a couple of other guns that fit onto this, but generally they're not here. A fair amount of the equipment, however, Oh, you're just going there for now, never mind. A fair few of my other nozzles and things live on the other fire engine, which I call Red Roof, and the others call the shelving rack. I have this board here, which is uh, part of what you'd be using for organising what you're doing. If you were at a, a proper fire station, you'd know where your things are. Then, use that. And then there is this which is a full breathing set for emergencies. That's respirators, breathing gear, oxygen. It's all not used anymore, but it's nice to have it. Followed by in here, this is a, a box that needs a bit of love, he says. There we go. Where we have some air tools, which plug into Jupiter's air system. So we have a chisel and of course, the reciprocating saw. And uh, it's part of the plan in the not too distant future to get these things working. Although I see no reason why this wouldn't work if I plugged it into the compressor. New plan, we're gonna go see if this works if I plug it into the compressor. It's not a good fit onto our compressor. You can hear it leaking, but let's find out if anything happens. Oh my. Oh my God, that's awesome. We are in shop so much stuff with this. On this side, we have more of the same. Over here, I have, well, nothing. I have another hose reel, the, uh, the retractable one, and I have a tow rope. 
I've never used it for anything. In here, this is my second row of hoses. Some of these came from the Midhance Railway, which is very kind to them, giving me a, a full, well, almost full uh, rack of hoses and another standpipe and key. Then this one is the more interesting. Because once again, it holds very little. It does, however, have my uniforms that I carry around with me for, for fun. And also where these chairs are, which we use when we go out places, we have this, which if I pull that up, rolls out. Now, you may have seen kicking around the shed, there is a Climax portable pump. And at some point, we'll get our backsides into gear and we'll put it on there. The problem is it's a two-man lift, so I need to have Jupiter outside to do it and two people to be able to lift it and put it back in there. And also we need to restore the frame. But you know, that's beside the point. So basically, it's not an equipped fire engine. I do not have anywhere near the amount of stuff I have that I kind of should have on a machine like this. On the other hand, I have lots of hoses and something we'll be doing in the summer, once I've got the pump working properly again, is that we will connect all the hoses up and see how many leak and work out which ones we've got which are good and operational. I can tell you though, that these lockers, particularly the other side I think, are pretty good for putting something like a bike in because I picked my brother up from Harwich once when he'd cycled home from, I think he cycled home from Turkey across Europe. And they got to Harwich and waiting for them was Jupiter. So we put the bikes in the side locker and drove home. He was not amused. And of course, coming round to the back is what everybody wants to see. What's in here? Yep, it is a pump. The pump is back in. We just haven't plumbed the pump up yet. Just haven't had the time as weather improves and we have it outside more. This is one of the things we'll get done. It's also just a pain because I need to get into this space in there where there's not an awful lot of space at all and be able to actually clamber around and get everything back in. The PTO is reconnected. The tank itself isn't. There's a, a connector down there that I haven't put back together again. Or maybe I have. Honestly, I can't remember. It just needs the final bits and it just needs a touch up and another coat of paint in it really i wanted to paint it before it went in but we kind of just put it back together but i've got some red to go over it so all of this needs a touch up and then we can get that together again other cool features are we have a little light in here the next big job are all these gauges across here should work and so far only a few of them do it's on my list of things to improve then above it up here we've got the suction hoses which live in oh go on off you go in there The bolt's not out, it's a bit stiff. It's a bit stiff, you see, because I haven't opened it in ages. So that's my suction hose in there, which is for um, connecting up to that thing. So we can suck water up and that will suck water in into the pump and back out. So if we're by a pond or a river or something, open water, we can suck up. I've done it a couple of times, it's quite good fun. I don't do it that often in all fairness. Somewhere there's the end that goes on that. For some reason, I've got the splitter on at the moment. Uh, there is a, just a big end piece that goes on. We've got these, which are the, the clamps that go on there to undo and do those, because they're tight. Then there's water in here. If I connect it to, say, if I wanted to connect it to a hydrant, that's what it would plug in to fill up the, the tank. Apart from that, there's the little drain valves down there. And obviously, pushing one of these down opens up the pump. It's never had the ball on the end of that. This one does. Um, yeah, and then the taps here and here are for the, the side one, that will open up that side one. And then there's this, this valve in there, which isn't connected at the moment, evidently, which will change it from low pressure to high pressure. Don't know why there's a low pressure or high pressure, but there is. Um, it's just how it is. That's about it for the back of here. Now, obviously the, the ladder though, this isn't the right ladder for it because it should have once got feet on it that locked into place with there. Currently, it's just held on with a, a bit of chain that stops it from rolling off. Um, and then I've got a tube to replace that because obviously it had water in it for quite some time. And uh, yeah, yeah, work in progress is the answer to most of this. So coming around to the crew compartment, we touched on it earlier, but there's room for four people back here. So up in here, I'll keep the door open because it swings itself shut. There didn't used to be seat belts. Now everything in here is fitted with lap belts to make it kind of safe to bring people in. 
It's all okay in here. I've replaced the roof lining up there that came out of the Essex fire engine. I have my battery isolator switch here, which is in a very annoying and awkward position. Behind me here, we should have where the breathing apparatus goes. I don't have any, so it doesn't live there. So I just hang my hem the uh, spare helmets up across there. Uh, under here is the, where the batteries are. And under there, that storage with nothing. Um, behind me there, that's the, the cover for getting to the gearbox and various other stuff in the PTO. It's okay back here. It's got a padded thing here. I've got a power steering thing here that I fill up for power steering. And the other side is the water for the radiator. It's all right. I've never ridden the back of it. Don't know what it's like. Not a clue. But uh, it's quite good fun. It's nice going out on days. There are some stains down the back here where it's outside where water runs down. It's my next big thing is to lift the roof and redo the seal across the top. That's the next big thing I want to do this summer if it keeps working okay. As long as she keeps running all right, that, that's the next big thing. And so at least if I do take it out in the rain, it doesn't get into the inside of her. She was really, had been mucked around with an awful lot when I got hold of her. I just found a, a wire brush. I wonder where that was. Um, obviously she's a 24 volt system truck because she's a lorry. So there's the two 12 volt batteries together down there, um, which means that in order to plug anything in on that side or when I've got doing anything to it, like replacing the bulbs, it's all got to be 24, not like your standard car bulb, um, bulbs, uh, which is just an added complication. Um, confusingly under here, positive is black, negative is red. I, I just don't ask. I have no understanding at all how that came to pass, but it did. And I really don't want to muck around with the wiring to sort it out. There's too many other niggly jobs to do on it. Apart from that, the, there's a couple of cracks in things like the side panels, but I literally can't get new ones of them. So they're just gonna have to do, I need to put some new fittings into this to hold it all back together properly. And again, you can see the checker plate that's been added there uh, from where the original door rotted. Um, it all bows and moves around a bit, but I can't really get replacements for it, so it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah, the back's not really that exciting. What is more exciting is the front. Well, here we are in the cab of Jupiter in, frankly, what could be one of my favourite locations in the entire world. Sitting in the driver's seat is just superb. I adore this thing. I adore being sat here. I love the size of this steering wheel. I love the dash with the two massive gauges on it. I just... I like being here. It's like an old friend, although it's an old friend who lets you down a lot. I know what I'm going to get. I know the sensation and charging around in this thing is just well, it's absolutely magnificent. So um, what we've got here, steering wheel, ignition is down there. My indicators and horn are here with the, the aftermarket blast. I've got hazards down there. My headlights are on the tab here and winter and wipers and wash are there. Then I've got a load of dials along here or dials. I've got a load of lights along here. I've got the battery discharge, I've got low air, the handbrake's on, low oil pressure, which isn't plumbed in, the rear fog, the pump bay light, which does work, the PTO light that does work, and the lockers, and that tells me if my locker lights are on. Then the indicator repeater, full lights, a full beam, speedo, and rev counter. The speedo is a um, rough guesstimate of how fast you're going. It's not the most um, accurate thing. It's it, There's a bit of variation in it. Then I've got uh, my battery charge indicator, I've got the air tank one, air tank two, fuel gauge, which is pretty empty at the moment, temperature gauge, which won't move for a while, the repeater for the blue lights, my pump hours, and the oil pressure gauge, which isn't plugged in. And I've got my temperature control unit here as well. Across here, I've got the additional controls, front fogs, rear fogs, the cab lights, which do work, and I've got a control up there so I can turn them on and off. The uh, offside and near side lockers. I've got the cab heater, which um, if I turn that on, all you'll hear will be the buzzer from the low up. Um, then I've got cold start. That doesn't work at the moment. The solenoid's packed up. And then I've got the beacons, which are the blue flashing lights. Interestingly enough, the reason that I've got one above my head here and one at the rear corner is it's a Norfolk fire service thing. They did it and no one else did it. They had them staggered like that. I don't know why, but it's just how they were. So that's why that. And then the two-tone. And the question that everybody wants to know, of course, is do they work? Well, Yes, of course they work. And, and if, if we lift the flap here, you'll notice there are two switches in the off, in the on position. Now if I do that and turn them off, that now means that I've immobilized the uh, 
the siren and the blues. That's so I can drive on the road and I can't activate them. Next door to them as well, there is a cigarette lighter adapter so I can plug in my USBs and run that. Under here, we have my fuses, which are all wonderfully old school and a little diagram telling me what they are. I really love this. Here is your map book holder. So your navigator can open this up and get out the map so they know where they're going. I've got a 1996 Atlas in there, which was the year that it left service. So that's kind of about as appropriate as I can get. I've got my gear stick here, PTO drive there, and my handbrake here. That really is about all there is to it. As I mentioned, I've replaced the headlining in here. This came out of a, an Essex truck because the one in here was knackered, and I didn't really care that it wasn't quite right. It's uh, quite good, and I, I also love this space here. I would love this thing. Um, it's got a big sound blanket on it to help try and keep it a bit quieter. It does very little for it. The engine is loud. It's a very loud engine, and it's wonderful for about the first five minutes of any journey and then it just becomes noise. But it, it, it's, it's a nice noise, it's just repetitive, I think is the simple term for it. Realistically, by the time I'm doing 30 miles an hour, I'm in fifth gear. By the time I'm kind of doing that, and then it's just drone, and yeah, you know, and about that's when the panic kind of ticks in of, oh my God, when's it gonna break again? And you're always listening for a new noise or anything like that. But that's beside the point. So that's basically all there is to it. And while I'm sat here in my fire engine getup, bear in mind that this uh, uniform that I'm wearing is totally inappropriate for this fire engine. It is totally the wrong stuff. It's just this stuff came with red roof. Uh, in fact, this helmet did, and most of the helmets around the back did as well. Um, and I've never actually done this, believe it or not. I've never sat in the driving seat wearing the full getup, but I feel quite happy doing it. I feel quite, uh, quite comfortable. And um, oh, the other thing is the seats aren't particularly comfortable. They're not designed for comfort. It's uh, it's um, there's not really a, a cruising vehicle. There's no sound system either. Now there's, there's a plug-in for a radio, so you could have your radio to talk to command, but um, I don't have the radio, so that's that's beside the side, kind of beside the point for that. Um, there are some other stuff in here that needs work. The front dash has cracked. I can't get another replacement because I don't can't do anything, so I need to look at trying to repair the plastic there. But it, it breaks on most of them. Like it is, there aren't that many to be able to find another one. Apart from that. It's okay. Most of this works. I've had a lot of the dash out and done a lot of work on that. It's it's all okay. So while I'm sat here, I thought I'd answer some of the questions that I get asked about it. Um, notably, the first ones are, do the blues work and does the two-tone work? Yes, yes, they do, as you can see. Have I ever had them on driving on the road? Um, yes, but under particular circumstances. I was taking part in the Ipswich to Felixstowe road run and they shut the road uh, along the promenade in Felixstowe. And I spoke to a policeman about it and said, can I turn the blues and twos on as I drive along this bit of road? Because it's shut. And he went, yes, you can. So um, I was acting under instruction and that was that's OK. Apart from that, they've only ever been on when I'm on private land or at shows and things. It's just it doesn't happen the rest of the time. Um, can I drive with them on? No, because I've got the kill switches, so I can't turn them on unless I'm actually using them. What's it like to drive? It's actually it's quite easy. The gearbox is... It's a bit of a challenge. You have to know what you're doing with it and it's a bit heavy. The clutch is heavy and the brakes are also very, very sensitive. If you just tap the brakes, just tap them, it stops. There's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then suddenly, <clears throat> getting used to them takes a bit. The first time I ever drove this, when I went to view it the first time, I had the guy selling it over there and my mate in the back. And I put my foot on the brakes like you do in a normal car, like I do in the 106. And the guy selling it, if there wasn't for the bar that runs across the windscreen, he'd gone through the windscreen and my mate ended up kind of over the side there um, as he kind of over that barrier. Uh, they, they are quite steep. Uh, my mum drove it before I uh, took it home and it was still on bent waters. Uh, yeah, she just couldn't get the hang of using the brakes because you have to be so gentle, 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 and then it stops. Now I've driven it around a bit, I know how they work, but it, it, it does take a bit getting used to and the clutch is quite heavy. But as a machine, the handling, it drives wonderfully. I love trundling around in it. I really, really love it. It's a lovely thing to drive. It's a lot easier with another person or two because the blind spots, you see the panel behind me, uh, that on the other side is a big blind spot. I can't see anything over there. So if I come across a junction at, a, at an angle, it's very difficult to see out. Um, they're old school mirrors as well, so I've got limited visibility with it. But generally speaking, she, she's lovely. She handles lovely and uh, it's a pleasure to drive it. Um, I also get asked a lot, should I buy a fire engine? Yeah, I think, and it's a lot of what we've kind of done 
in the shed um, with things that we've been offered and we kind of take the logic we'd rather be the people who bought something and failed than somebody who bought something well who didn't buy something and then went i wonder what would have happened this or i wonder if i'd got that and that's that's why i got dupes because i wanted to be the person who went I bought it and it all went wrong. Well, actually, I wanted to be the person who said I bought it and it all went right, but I'd rather be the person who bought it and it all went wrong than five years on being like, I wonder what happened if I bought that fire engine. And so it, it doesn't really matter what it is. It doesn't matter if you're thinking about buying a fire engine or a locomotive or a boat or a spaceship or doing a trip somewhere or just doing something. As long as you're not going to financially cripple yourself and you've got the money to do it, just go with it. It's it's always better to do these things and learn and to have tried it and at the worst case be like, hmm, that was a mistake, rather than always sitting there going, wonder what would have happened. So, uh, yeah, highly recommend doing it. Um, that said, I mean, one of the other questions I do get asked a lot is if I could only keep one of my collection, what would it be? It would be this. We are very lucky with the shed. We know we're very, very lucky to be able to have access to it. And our landlords are superb for repeatedly putting up with us. But really, you, to have something like this, you need storage and you need to keep it undercover. I had it outside for about the first two, one, one and a half years of owning it. And it made the leak back there a lot worse and it made a couple of other problems appear with the machine. They don't like being outdoors. Any vintage vehicle doesn't like being stored outdoors. So um, I think for that reason, you, you do need understuff, undercover storage for these things. So highly recommend having storage if you do, but do think about these kind of things and getting it. Um, I was get asked, what do actual firefighters think of it? And I'm quite amused by it, really. I've had, um, when I've been driving along and I've seen a fire engine not go into a shout, drive me off the way, I've had thumbs up and waves, which is really nice. Um, I had one when I was driving once, um, where they were on a shout obviously looking for a place so i stopped to let them go and they went no no no, you are through we're looking so i got i got given away by an actual fire engine so that amused me um and i'm always amazed about the uh, fire appliance preservationists how nice they are uh, particularly stephen who i chat to quite a bit who is an actual ex-fire serviceman um and how nice he is to tell me a lot of things about fire engines and to film in my massive gaps of knowledge and I think that's very nice that someone who actually was a firefighter who kind of actually knows machines and wants to save them because he used to work on things that are similar is welcoming to someone who's a complete idiot who bought a fire engine knowing nothing. Um, which brings us on to the next questions. Before I bought Jupiter, did I have any kind of mechanical background? Nope, none whatsoever. I, I just kind of thought, yeah, I can probably do that. I'd, you know, I would think I was a fireman at that stage, maybe a driver on the steam railway. No, I was a fireman, I was a fireman. Um, so I had a vague understanding of how things went together, but no skills whatsoever. Um, and then other question I get asked is, were you a massive fire engine enthusiast or are you a massive fire engine enthusiast? Not really, not, not really. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I'd see them go past and go, that's cool, but not to any way to kind of any mass things. I don't know much about fire. In fact, I know very little about fire engines, full stop. I know a bit about this because it's mine but I don't know anything. People ask me technical questions about it all the time, and I'm like, yes, yes, it, it's definitely that. I don't know. It's, it's, she just seemed like a good idea. I'm very happy with it, but I, I don't know anything. It wasn't something I was passionate about. I think it's something you find a lot of the time as well, that people who are big, proper enthusiasts, like people who get annoyed about my uh, doors having the check plate on and not being right and having the wrong signs on it and things, they're the people who quite often don't have machines it's the people who aren't the die-hard enthusiasts that actually end up buying a machine quite often i find um but it's yeah it's quite nice uh people also ask has it ever been mistaken for an active fire engine so far no it's not actually no that's a light i have been once uh, i went to the fish and chip shop pulled up outside uh, went in and they gave me free fish and chips because they thought I was a fire, an actual fire engine and I was a firefighter. So I had to kind of go, thank you very much, but I, I'm not actually a fireman. She's, she's just my pride and joy. She's my toy. So I chatted to the bloke for a bit and he was so impressed with it. He still gave us my fish and chips for free because he just thought what a wonderful thing to have. And I like that. Um, people are generally very nice to it. They genuinely uh, give, give way or if I'm on a smaller road, pull over to let it pass. 50% uh, of that is probably they think it's a fire engine. The other 50% is, oh my God, this lumbering beast coming towards me. I need to get out of the way. 
so that's a, that's a big part of it really um people also kind of say do i think i'd have the channel without dupes and i don't know it, everything would be very different without jupiter the whole collection the way we go about things would be very different she's such a big part of the collection and she was my second vehicle it's the second thing i ever what well, the first vehicle i ever bought because my name gave me the 106 this is the first vehicle i ever bought my second ever vehicle um possibly a mistake to do that in that order but there we are she's she's quite nice um people also ask how much it was it wasn't that much money fire engines are cheap i mean you can go and have a look on online and they they got a bit more expensive but fire engines don't cost much it's an awfully lot of met, lot of metal for not much money um and i've got my hdv license to be able to drive it because she is over as i've said earlier she's gross plated to be 11 over 11 tons so you need to have a a category c in the uk um license to be able to drive it um yeah that's about it that's all the questions i can think of oh is it expensive to run yes well and what kind of mpg does it do? uh i've worked out that roughly 40 quid this is a couple of years ago before the prices went up even more but roughly 40 quid of diesel gets me 100 miles it's not particularly efficient but it's, a, it's an 8.8 .8 litre v8 in there and then people also ask is it expensive to maintain and yes and no some bits are um i think when we changed the oil last time we got a 20 a 20 litre uh, tub of oil and she drank most of it to change the oil on it um filters and stuff not so bad when things go wrong they're very expensive because there aren't necessarily other ones available um unless you're lucky and you find like parts in the scrapyard like the um the compressor i've got on it at the moment no that's come off red roof the compressor to go on red roof will be at the scrapyard um so some things are on the other hand it's done no mileage i mean currently we're sat here it's on thirty-seven thousand one hundred and eighteen miles i think when i got it it was on thirty-five nine hundred. so I've, I've done a little more than a thousand miles in five years it's not really stressing it is it i mean that's quite amazing though for a 40 year old vehicle to have done 37,000 miles isn't it she's she's done well um do i regret buying it i get asked a lot as well and no no it's been a challenge don't get me wrong and it's been a lot more of a challenge than i ever thought it would be but it's it's just a wonderful thing to have it's just i don't know i just love this thing i even when it's a pain i unconditionally love it just absolutely unconditionally love it it's a wonderful thing and it, it's one of those things I, a lot of things i like are things that really shouldn't have survived and really there shouldn't be a 40 year old fire engine still kicking around there's no real reason for it still to be here but i love the fact that it still is and i'm so happy to be her guardian and to just keep her safe for a bit longer so that more people can enjoy it and more people will be able to see kind of like the evolution of the fire engine and with every passing year her more basic design becomes more and more apparent compared to a modern appliance um i mean there's no computers or anything on this if i go around a corner the fuel gauge flatters kind of flutters around there's there's nothing on this this is a fully old school analog truck and i, I love that about it i absolutely do adore that about it um and the other question have any of the other team driven it no no the people who have driven it so far are me um lewis who you've seen in a couple of videos ages ago he hasn't been up for a while and my mum that that is the list of people who have actually been able to drive this thing it's not a lot of people uh, mainly because you know, where, do, where do you take it to take people to drive i need to take it some private land uh, significantly more than we've got up here to make it work um so yeah i think that's basically the main questions i get asked about it it's it is a wonderful thing i'm very lucky to have it so anyway, i hope this has been um, interesting to you guys i hope you've got the answer to your question so I'll walk around and you've seen the bits and bobs that you wanted to about dupes uh, let me know if there's other stuff you want to know we will in the summer be getting the pump working once it's a bit dry and we can get it out and fiddle around with, around with it um, and we will be running the pump and testing the pump and actually showing that working that will happen providing the truck doesn't break anymore but hopefully that'll be happening and hopefully we'll be getting her out a bit more this year um just hopefully some shows if they happen if not just get her out and about and trundle about a bit because it just yeah it's a lovely thing to drive about in as long as i don't need to go too far um, but hopefully she'll be out about a bit and enjoy her in her 40th year so guys thank you very much for watching i hope you've enjoyed it i hope it's answered your questions uh let me know in the comments below if you want to know anything else about it and we'll do that in a future video remember also we've got our tea Britain spring shop so you can buy things like this cool hoodie um because that's that's kind of cool this all stuff by the way all came out of red roof this the um quite a few of the nozzles are still on red roof uh most of the helmets came out of red roof so I don't even know where these originated from. 
but they're quite nice and warm in the middle of winter. So that's it. I'm going to leave you guys now with a compilation of Jupiter trundling about in some of the previous videos, and um, thanks for watching. There'll be a couple of suggestions at the end of that of other things with Jupiter, so you guys can watch that if you want to. And of course, thank you for support, and uh, we'll see you next time.